Hi everybody. Um, uh, firstly, uh, this video was meant to go out yesterday because um, we uh, had a failure of technology. As, as you know, and you've heard me say this before, what can you do? But anyway, I am here today and I am interviewing an absolutely amazing woman who's making so much difference in the world. I am in awe of her. She's a senior, uh, senior youth practitioner working with youth offenders and leading in child sexual exploitation. Founder of Two Raised Hope, non-profit organization supporting vulnerable members of society in India. Motivational speaker, life coach, campaigner for equality and diversity. I could go on and on and on. She's much, much more than that. Uh, today, her journey is going to be about her drive, her struggles, and her inspiration to become an absolutely amazing human being. Please welcome everybody, Ash Ture. I am so happy to have you on. Hi, Ash. I know I probably pronounced your surname wrong. Is it Ture or Ture? No. Perfect. It's Ture. It's Ture. Hi. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just so disappointed that we couldn't go on live. But hey, you know, this is this is what technology is about. But Ash, I mean, you know, look, all the things. I mean, I've only named a small fraction of what you've done. You have a whole list of things what you have achieved <laughs> at such a young age. You are so inspiring as a human being, you know. And and when I spoke to you on the phone, um, I what I got from you was. It wasn't just about, you really want to go and make a difference in the world. You want to impact the world with everything that you've gone through. You're bringing it out of yourself and going out there and helping other human beings to better their lives and support them. I just want you to tell me in a few words, what drives you to have that passion? We'll, work, we'll talk about everything you've done, but what drives mm -hmm. you to have that passion? My passion definitely comes from my life experiences. Um, having a rare skin condition has, I think, made me a very, very empathetic person. And the passion that I have definitely comes from being there myself and acknowledging that sometimes we don't really um, speak about the things we should. Um, be it a skin condition, be it a disability, be it, you know, a lot of the taboo subjects, especially within our Asian community as well. Again, my drive comes from, I know that within our community, we have a lot of taboo subjects still. You know, you're catering for a market as well. I've seen some of your stuff. So it's about talking about the things that people brush under the carpet sometimes. Um, but my passion definitely is... Um, my life experiences and trying to like you said just trying to make that difference I just feel that if I can help one person not to feel alone or feel that they're on this life journey by themselves I'm a happy woman uh, I mean I mean that's amazing I mean talking about you know you said that you've got a skin condition how did that impact you as growing up as a child oh it was very difficult like my mum tells me the first three months of my life was at, in hospital because at that time it's so my skin condition is called congenital pigmented nevi so um, if I put it in simple terms they're beauty spots for a lot of them and the pigment in them is very dark so at a young age you can it can form cancer so it's uh, affects like one in 500,000 so it's very rare um, so it comes in different forms, you know, you know, some people might have like, you know, like you see uh, port wine stains and, you know, they can be big, they can be small. So it, it can vary. So with that, again, at an early age, at my time, people didn't have a lot of knowledge or know what the condition was. So, you know, there was lots of weird and wonderful ideas, do this, do that. But in terms of um, surgery, in terms of my parents, I've been so, so blessed and so lucky that my parents were forward thinking Asians. Mm. Um, because had it been a different way, um, I don't know where I'd been. So um, I've probably had over a hundred procedures in my life. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, a lot. So um, uh, 70 stitches in my face, 70 stitches in my hands, 
And at that time, because um, there was a risk of cancer being formed, that was like the option in terms of, you know, because like surgeons didn't know a lot about it as well. It was more about actually how can we reduce the risk of cancer? Because a lot of people say to me, oh, was it just cosmetic? But at that time, when it, my operation started, they literally started from when I was born. So the main aim was, so let's not, let's reduce the uh, chance of cancer basically and then obviously as time went on and i grew up being a female um there was an aesthetic element as well because obviously nobody likes to be different when i was in school experienced a lot of bullying so that was like from primary to junior school you know kids can be very cruel um, so from there as well you know just schooling wise that was difficult you know the bullying again like i said experiencing that it, that sometimes it was like living two lives because I had such a wonderful family life. Yeah. Um, but then obviously when I'd go to school, there would be like bullying and stuff, but I didn't want to bring that home. I didn't want to tell my parents because again, like my family life was so good. So again, suffering in silence. Um, but again, as I got a little bit older, junior school, that was very, very hard. Cause as you know, teenage years, boyfriends, yeah. girlfriends, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, but then life slowly, slowly changed in terms of when I got to the age of about 16, yeah. um, I decided I was just not going to have the, the major operations anymore. I was trying that laser treatment and stuff like that. Um, but again, it was, it came to a point where I was just like, you know what, I've just had enough now. So I stopped the surgery, stopped the laser uh, treatment. And did, just you kind of went this, did you make those choices then? Yes. yes. Stop that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And even at a younger age, I remember, I think I must have been about 10 or 11. I remember my mum and dad having a conversation with me, like, look, if you don't want to have any more operations and stuff, you can tell us because this is what. And um, I think that was really important, those conversations that my parents used to have with me. So I never had the pressure. And at home, again, I was never made to feel any different. And had again had i been in a different family or a circumstance you know like in our community as well they have like oh um yes, we do. i know someone cursed the baby or it was something you ate or if you oh, sleep on, yeah yeah my mum used to get it all my mum used to get oh if you sleep with her on the floor for seven days or yes. um it would magically go away if you eat this you know there were so many things and obviously my mum didn't have a lot of knowledge about the, the the condition as well so she just kind of did the best she could um, and she did, she did like a wonderful job, you know, again, I was having the operations, but I know my mum and dad were feeling the pain, yeah. if that makes sense, yeah. so every step of the way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've got an older brother and sister, and they were wonderful as, as well during the time, just, you know, supporting and being there. The, I never had felt any different. Yeah. So it was kind of like living two lives. So when you, were, when you were 16, you decided no longer that you're going to do these, these ops anymore. What, what what changed within yourself? Um, I think at the age of 16, I, uh, through, again, the hospital, I discovered uh, a camouflage makeup. Mm -hmm. um, so what that did is, with the scarring, it's heavier than normal makeup. It just gives a little bit of extra kind of coverage. Mm -hmm. And with that, I was kind of finding a new me. I was discovering a new side of me and it gave me a little bit of confidence and it just made me feel like actually like how long am I going to do this for I was still having like some laser then um at that point yeah. um because I was just experimenting and seeing if the scarring would get any better but I think it was a different phase I just went into a different phase um yeah. and I think I was still struggling with self-acceptance at that point because again I was now I was like, before I had the birthmarks and it was, it was clear, you know, that the spots were on the face and stuff. I'll share a, a, a picture actually, so you can put, put that on the profile that might give people a better idea of things. Yeah. Um, and then it was kind of struggling with actually, I'm in the middle now, like people, some people see the scarring, some people don't. So again, it was, it was battling again yeah. <laughs> about actually where am I at? And then it comes to obviously that, that, phase where you know uh, you're going out more you're discovering you know some freedom teenage years you know being able to go out with your friends and stuff like that so the focus changed a little bit and uh, you know luckily I had a friendship group um which just 
kind of saw me for me and that was the first time um since junior and primary school that I had a group that I was just ash and I think that gave me a lot of kind of confidence as well but really I think my self-discovery um journey probably only started about four to five years ago right real self-acceptance so, so it's really yeah so when you when you had that friend circle so you know what i'm hearing is that you surrounded yourself just you it happened to be that way but you surrounded yourself with really good positive people around you who 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 were who made you look at the fact that you know what behind all of that there is a human being that is full of love and joy because that's what I see I don't know you that well but that's what comes across obviously in your work as well but you know they saw that in you uh, and um, yeah and so so after that where so where did you ignite where did you know the you ignited yourself to do all this work where did that when did that come and where where did it come from was it a situation or was it an internal feeling that you had Okay, so I went to university, did my studies and everything then, and again, I was still having laser treatment uh, there. Um, so that came to a stop probably when I got my degree, come out. I did criminology and criminal law, um, which I really loved. And I always wanted to go into um, a career path that would help others. So that was in me at a lot, really early age. Even when I used to go and have my operations, like it was my second home. So I would be like with the nurses and bringing the younger children in and helping yeah. them, you know, play with them. So the, I always had that in me. And I think, again, that comes from a place of real loneliness. I didn't want anyone else to feel like that. Wow. So then, um, yeah, I went for a job interview, which was crazy because I said after university I'm taking at least a year to myself that didn't happen yeah. I just got bored um, so I went for um, an admin post actually um, and there the person that interviewed me they were like is this what you really want to do because obviously you've just come out of university and stuff mm. and it was at the youth spending service so she said you know what I might have something else in mind for you and my journey with you know youth justice and working with young offenders um, just came out like that really yeah. and then um you know, going to and fro yeah can i ask you so i'm obviously i'm gonna i'm gonna pick up stuff that you say and then it, i i i said i feel something that i want to say so you said you made a point about how you didn't want anyone else to be lonely in your you know in their journeys of life so yep. was there times when you really felt really really lonely inside yourself yes Definitely. But I didn't acknowledge that loneliness till adulthood, believe it or not. As a child, again, you know, the bullying, and et cetera, was there. But because I had such a contrast at home with the love and the care, it, it took a backseat. It was always there, but I had something else that was so positive. And like you said, having positivity around you and people around you that, that make you feel a certain way and, and yeah. believe in yourself, um, it gives you a diff different kind of strength. That's the only way I can describe it. You know, I think people with disabilities, with skin conditions, you know, with, with mental health, we all have, I think, that choice mm -hmm. of actually, do we just give up and do nothing? Or do we kind of actually say, how am I going to tackle this? Um, you know, and it's difficult, but I yeah. think that choice comes when you are surrounded with positivity. Like I said, if I hadn't had that, I don't know where I'd be. And that's, that I'm just being really honest. Yeah. So when you was working as a youth practitioner, after how long did you realise that you had a real passion for this job, that you was really good at it? Yeah. Because you're a senior um, now. You're a senior now. Yes. Um, I think what it was, I think it was the first time where one of uh, the managers, because I was like on a, um, uh, it was a sessional basis. Mm -hmm. And literally, it was the third time he called me to say, Ash, when are you going to sign a contract? I want yeah. you to be a full time member of staff. And I was just like, yeah, you know, I'm happy go lucky. I don't want to, I don't want to be like, you know, held down. by <laughs> Yeah. And um, I think that was when, when I actually signed on the dotted line and I started that knowing that, you know what, actually these young people that are coming into the criminal justice process system, mm. like a lot of the time they're victims. They're not, you know, we, we, yeah. society sees them in a certain way. Yeah. Um, especially girls that I work with, 90% of them, unfortunately, had experienced some kind of abuse. 
yeah. And often I'd be the first person that they've disclosed that to. And to just have that like, oh my God, okay, from a bad situation, at least they've been able to offload that. Um, I just fell in love with the job. I was just like, this is, this is what I want to do. And just... And it seems, like you had, it seems like you had a lot of relatability with young children. You could really relate to them, you know, especially, you know, if they've been on the streets and offending on the streets, you know, you, it, that's a very fearful place to be in. And, and, and obviously inside of themselves, there's lots of fear inside of them and isolation inside of them. That's why they join um, these gangs and go on the streets. So, you know, I, I sense that you had something you could really relate to them as from heart to heart, right? Absolutely. It's a sense of belonging again, isn't it? Yeah. You know, a lot of the group offending that we see, it is a sense of belonging. Young people, often maybe if they're not getting it at home or if they've been through some kind of, you know, childhood trauma, Yeah. you know, they want to be a part of something and that can often, you know, come with the grooming side of it. It can come with a lot of added extras. So again, I think it's that sense of belonging. We all want to belong. Yes, we do. We you know? need to. I think physiologically we need to have some sort of belonging. I think, you know, Absolutely. caveman time, going back to that sort of time, you know, we need to belong to, to, to some, uh, some sort of group. Um, also, I wanted to say to you, when did you, you know, you said your, your personal journey of self-discovery only started five years ago. So what made you step into that? Right. So what was happening was stress. I had a lot of stress, but I'm one of these people that I thought, I'm not stressed, I'm not stressed, yeah. but um, yeah. what started to happen, I locked your IBS. Oh. So, yeah, and I didn't kind of put two and two together, but went to see the doctor, and I was just like, you know, my jaw, literally, when my jaw used to lock, touch wood, it's got a lot better now, and I can kind of see the signs, and I can control it, but literally, it used to just be locked. I couldn't eat, I couldn't Gosh. drink this side, yeah, nothing. And the doctor was like, oh, are you stressed? And I was like, no, I'm fine. He was like, okay, so tell me a bit about what you do. Tell me about your life. And I was like, yeah. I do. And he was like, right, let me tell you something. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the, the people that come in here and they say they're stressed, we don't worry about it too much. It's people yeah. like you. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm just a nice little swan paddling with my legs in the water going like this all the time. You know, yeah, I'm fine. I know that feeling. And that's when I acknowledged actually the, the, the connection between mind, body and soul, because yeah. he had actually said to me that like your stress is coming out in your body just yeah. because you're not feeling it. It's, it's, you know, it, your jaw, your IBS, you know, they're all related to stress. So, okay. You know, I took a little step back, started um, my meditation journey. I started um, reading, reading a lot. I started following Louise Hay. Who yeah, I, I love think is Louise Hay. Amazing. Absolutely love it. She was one of the first people I ever, I ever read. A, I read a book when I was about 20. So mm. quite a few, she's amazing. Yes. And before that, I'd read The Secret and yeah. uh, Power and stuff. And, you know, I've always kind of had that kind of self-help, self-motivation. Like, I like to do things by myself. Mm. I don't like to rely on people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, Louise Hay, I went to a few conferences. Um, and I discovered a really different side to myself yeah. in terms of meditation so um once when i went to the conference we spoke about angels and i've always had a love for peacocks always yeah um but until i did a meditation conference and saw actually your angels come to you in different ways yeah i actually realized that a peacock was actually my angel it always been with me and in difficult times yeah and I, I actually had why you, yeah you I was wondering why you had that as your logo didn't you you've got a peacock I was wondering what the connection was okay yeah. yes okay. so and literally nearly every day in some form or another I see a peacock wow. you know and for me that is my angels they were you know it's so, so random I'm going to tell you a random story uh Miller and Carter yeah um you know uh oh my god um it's near oh forget the road now how can I forget is that this is that the one near Seven Kings or where it was yes yeah, yeah near William yeah. Corbett school yeah yeah so 
literally I was ha when talking about my journey and talking about the first time I was making the decision like I want to go to India and do this voluntary work mm. um I went to actually see one of my friends and um it was at that Miller and Carter and I was sitting there and I was thinking oh my god am I actually doing the right thing like yeah. what am I doing yeah. and believe I opened my eyes and no word of a lie I have a photo to prove it a white peacock was there no and I, a real one actual real white peacock I promise you, a real one. In the middle just of nowhere? Outside, oh my God. And I was just like, what? And I went in there and I was like chatting to the barman there. I was like, do you often get a white peacock here? And I'm, I swear they must have thought I was mad. They were like, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you took, that, you took that as being a sign, right? To start. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that just made me smile from ear to ear. Yeah. Um, but the journey started like uh, 2017, basically, in terms of two raise hope. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping a bit now. I know from right. like my two, two, raise, two raise hope is what you do, and it's it's a voluntary thing, a voluntary organisation that you work with, and you work in India. I mean, you know, some yeah. of the work I've gone through your page and some of the things you do there. To explain a little bit about what you actually do with children. Yeah, some of the stories you told me were quite horrific, but just kind of <laughs> let's, keep it, let's keep it a little bit safe. Yes. Of course, of course. Yeah. So basically, um, it's been three years now, but officially the web page and Two Raise Hope, um, the logo, with the kindly my godson, Inquisitive, um, put yeah. my vision on paper for me. Oh, Again, he's, he's yes. your godson. Oh my gosh. Yes, he is. I love yes. his work. Amazing. He's amazing. Yes, he is. Inquisitive. So, if yeah. anyone's wondering what that is, Inquisitive, please explain because we can give him a shout out right now. Yes, yes. He is an artist um, and he does some amazing, amazing bespoke work, you know, uh, commissioned, everything. He does everything by, by hand. He's very, very talented. And, you know, I was so fortunate to have him help me with my vision and put that down on paper and when it did when he did yeah. I was just like oh my god it was just yeah. perfect yeah um, and my dad to raise hope my dad was the one literally I spent months and months trying yeah. to think of a name and my dad just like that I was he was like what's the matter what are you doing and I was like no I'm thinking of a name blah 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 and it was actually raise hope and I was like oh my god that's perfect so it's got my yeah. surname in it and yeah. the peacock and the hope it just all fit in so nicely together why India why why did you go to India I mean that's okay. like yeah so you India said you had a love of India but how yeah. did you go and find these organizations to work with yeah so what happened was uh, since a child we've been going to India dad's from Delhi mum's from Mumbai so we've kind yeah. of I've always been um, to India and had a love for India uh -huh. but once I started my, my, my work um, what happened was when I was seeing the children on the streets yeah. in the last probably three to four trips I went to India I was just it was just getting to me more and more every time yeah. I saw them and then again by chance I was having a conversation with um, a, a friend a family friend there and they were like oh Ash remember you told me you really want to come and do some voluntary work here there's an organization called Granthi yeah. and they work with young women um, their mothers are either still um, in the red light district or yeah. you know they're, they're coming out of it and it might be something you're interested in didn't think of it much there came back got in touch with them and it was just again you know some of the things that I say people are gonna think mm. but they honestly when things happen when the universe gives you a calling it gives you a calling and, and it's about listening to that calling as well you gotta hear it right you gotta hear it yeah. Emailed them. I said, you know, I've heard about your organisation, blah blah blah. Do you have any voluntary? And literally, I was just going to go for two weeks. That was my plan. Mm. Um, sent the email. Believe it or not, got a phone call back within hours saying, "Oh hi, um, actually our CEO is in London right now. Um, I can put you in touch with them. Would you like to meet her?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah fine." Yeah. Didn't think much of it. Again, then, again, the next day, got a phone call, and there were. Uh, um, I asked where they were. Um, I work in the borough of Newham, so she told me, "Oh, we're staying at um, the Double Tree in Docklands." And I was like, "That was like five minutes from where I work." It just, and I, I just no such thing as coincidences, right? 
absolutely and I was like but you know then I started thinking oh you're a charity blah 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 what had happened the girls they through art therapy they do drama and they were performing and that one of the guys in the audience was actually the owner of the double tree oh, and yes. said to them and they were sofa surfing at the time and he said no you're going to come in the hotel like stay there for your stay as long yeah. as you, you need to basically I went, I did a workshop, it was supposed to be an hour, turned out that I ended up staying there for three hours and I just fell in love with the girls there and I was just like, this is what I have to do. Wow. Um, and then that was in the July and by the November, I was out there doing my watery work. Well, and how, how, I mean, you go there, how, how long do you stay there then? So usually it's between four to maybe six weeks. I try and do it over the, the Christmas holidays, yeah. um, which my nieces are not happy about because no, 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 like, oh, no. you know, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, obviously I do work full time as well, so um, it does get difficult. But what I usually do is where I used to have two, three holidays a year, I try and save my holidays and do that in, in a chunk. So, so as much time as, as possible I can get off, I try and take during that time. Yeah. Um, so my first year I was mainly in Mumbai. Um, my second year I was in Lucknow and Mumbai, and then this year branched out to Punjab and Delhi as well. So acid attack um, survivors, um, Punjab. There is a charity that work with uh, boys with substance misuse, which is um, huge. Um, it's a huge, isn't it? It really I mean, is. I mean, yeah. Yeah, to be fair, I knew it was big, but I didn't know it was that big until I got there, to be fair. And you, then, um, you, you, sorry, I'm kind of, you know, you're saying that all these things that, you know, as Asians don't talk about, we need to talk about these things more often. We really do. You know, all these things like it, sexual exploitation, you know, there's poor girls, you know, daughters of the sex workers in, in Mumbai, you know, the challenges yeah. and stuff that they must go through must be awful we just don't want to talk about yeah. it what you know what somebody said to me the other day which i found fascinating i can't remember i think i was watching a movie with somebody and it was actually my husband and um he said to me and they, they showed like an indian movie they showed a kissing scene and um he went oh my god indian movies and they were in the shower the couple <laughs> were in the shower and he was like indian movies oh my god i said of course indians don't have sex do they and he yeah. looked at me and it, i was like of course they don't well this happens does it really <laughs> They're oh, gifts from God. Century. <laughs> Hello. But it's just, yeah, it's, it's, and I'm, my husband's 52. <laughs> but I'm just saying people, <laughs> Asians don't want to talk about these things. But that, yeah. that's the reality. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's still such... The, taboo subject you know even HIV and AIDS so Mumbai I work with Happy Feet Home they provide yeah. uh, palliative care and they do such an amazing job and some of the stories you hear about oh if I touch you I might get HIV or AIDS that is still the mentality yeah. there mm. and I think to some extent that's still the mentality with some Asian people and it takes people like us, I think, to educate yeah. people yeah. because at the end of the yeah. day, I'm, I'm really proud of my family network. You know, we are quite yeah. open, we talk, but not everybody is as fortunate. And again, well, that's hats why off I do to your parents. Do. Hats off to your parents, honestly. They sound like they have brought you up and they've given you all the love. They sound like they're amazing. They really do. They, they, they are role models for people to understand how, you know, as Asian people, I mean, we're great, we're moving forward, but we need to go a little bit faster now. And, you know, yes. they are a pro proper example, honestly. And especially for that era as well, you know. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Who definitely being, you know, 10 steps ahead. I, I must, you know, like I said, I'm so lucky yeah. Yeah. to have got the parents that I did because if I hadn't, I, I really, and I know I keep saying it, but I really don't know where I would be, yeah. you know, because especially in that era as well, had they have had the mindset that, oh my God, something, it was something we done or yeah. somebody done, you know, black magic. Oh my God. Life could have been very different. Very different, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, so you, you're a young lady that goes and lives in Mumbai. My mum wouldn't even let me travel from Punjab to Delhi on a train on my own. And I had Kimmy then, and Kimmy was about four years old. And she was like, oh my God. You I said, mum, we travel the world. Why am I not traveling in my own like home motherland? 
Yeah. You're going to say to me, I can't even go on a four hour journey and trek. Oh, but you don't know what Delhi is like, you know. I was like, yeah. But, you know, I mean, you're in India on your own for six weeks. Yep. You have to be careful. Um, I have got friends and family out there, so I'm fortunate. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. However, I don't kind of live in that area because my work is very much towards a different area to where my family lives. Okay. But I've always got, you know, speed dials if I need them yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but for me, yes, the first year my mum and dad found it hard. Like, are you sure? Like, mm. even my brother, you know, to just yeah, be like, course. okay, why you're like, are you sure? Yeah, but you have to, you know, you have to think um, logically. You have to be safe. You know, I don't take any unnecessary risks. Um, but the way I see it, my philosophy is if something's going to happen to me, it can happen to me in the UK, it can happen to me in America, it can happen to me anywhere. Yeah. You know, so if I live my life in fear, again, this is a part of my journey in terms of meditation, in terms of finding myself. If I live with fear, I'm never going to do anything. Yeah. So... So a part of my journey was conquering my fears. I've walked on glass. Um, that was fire, you fire walking. I would love to do that next yeah. on the list. Yeah. It's on the list. Yeah. And I had I had a fear of heights. So uh, oh, CN oh, Tower. Wow. Honestly, in Canada. I tell you, my fear of heights is horrendous. I went to uh, Centre Park. <laughs> and literally, a, I don't know what the go the go eight thing, but it's a miniature version. And right. I, I was the first one up there, and as soon as I got up, and it was literally walking up a pole, I got to the top of the pole, and I was like, oh, I can't do this. I froze. I was shocked. I didn't even realise I had a fear of heights. I was shocked. Oh, wow. Anyway, the, the train had got me through it, but I, honestly. But getting over oh, that, really, it's great. Going back to getting over that, you know, all yeah. the things that you've got over, going back to, you know, you working in Mumbai, working in Lucknow, working in Punjab, you know, helping these people. What do you offer these children? What do you give these children? How do you work with them? Yeah, so to raise hope, what we do is bespoke workshops. So palliative care, I will look around dreams, hope, aspirations, deliver workshops around that. One-to-one uh, -one coaching um, with the young kids that are kind of facing a lot of taboos, a lot of kind of, um, you know, discrimination. Yeah. there so it's about educating them I also train the staff there as well so um, be that consultation work in terms of their organizations um, so it's around bespoke in things and I take all the skills I have in my current working role so I'm trained in um, delivering uh, substance misuse you know doing screenings kind of seeing where young people are with that um, I've done uh, basic coaching looking at um, young people and them reaching their aspirations and coaching diplomas various outside of my work role so I kind of take that as well so I've been trained in various different I've been really lucky in in the line of work that I do because we get a lot of scope to learn different skills because I work within the courts I work alongside social children social care the police so it's given me a lot of skills over the years Wow. So I'm trained in um, delivering uh, harmful sexual behaviour uh, workshops, ch child sexual exploitation. So I kind of take it all and do bespoke stuff. So with the acid attack survivors, I did stuff around mental health um, yeah. and, you know, post-traumatic stress and, you know, stuff that they may be experiencing. And also did a consultation um, with the workers there and the volunteers that came, trained them too. So, yeah. so what, what kind of attitude do you think you've had to adopt to, to be able to do this work? Um, being thick skinned, most definitely. <laughs> mm. um, because again, you know, there's still a lot of hardships you have to face. You know, again, me being from London, going over to India, you know, when they see a foreigner, you know, they have certain uh, views or they have certain things. Sometimes it's just like, well, actually, what's she going to teach us? And other yeah, times... Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. When it's been... Um, so the organisations that approach me, the people will be amazing. But then you have, like, the older generation and... You know, it's a bit stereotypical, but it's true, especially the older men there. They think, hmm, what's she actually going to teach us? Wow. But, I'm, yeah, but I'm happy to say at the end, you know, when they, I give my evaluation forms out and stuff, 
you know, the feedback's been really positive, but I think initially there are a lot of taboos. And I think now I feel that this is my calling and this is where I want to be kind of full time. And again, it's about the next phase in my journey. I've been fortunate enough this time um, to do um, stuff around body positivity as well here. Yeah. So I was involved here in, in the UK. Here in the UK, yes. So that was a new venture that came out as well. So I struggled. Um, I've mentioned in some of my um, lives that I've done before, I have suffered with depression and anxiety. I still yeah. battle with anxiety. Yeah. So um, during a, a very difficult time in my uh, life, I would probably say the lowest time. Um, yeah. Through it again you know, opportunities happen. Um, my friend uh, was coming from LA and was getting involved in the real catwalk and it was about body positivity, acceptance. Wow, yeah. Yeah, people embracing beauty in different ways. Mm -hmm. And originally I wasn't going to do it because I was quite low. I was thinking, yeah. you know, this is not, but then the other part of me was like, you know what, I need to do this. Again, that kind of like opportunities come for a reason. And I'm so glad that she pushed me to do it because again, it made me get out of that depression, that feeling alone. And again, like I said, you know, yeah. I don't think I acknowledged all the trauma that I'd been through as a yeah. child. Yeah. And, you know, I'm working on a few other projects. So it made me kind of think and go back to my childhood. And I think that was having a lot of psychological effect on me. Oh, okay. But I get that. I get that. Yeah, but again, with that positivity, with channeling that in something positive, like the real catwalk, um, which I never ever thought I'd do, because again, I've battled with people making comments on my looks and my birthmarks all my life. So what, you know, why should I be on that catwalk? But yeah. why shouldn't I be? You know, so yeah, I was just absolutely. like, I've got to go. Go, go yeah. yeah, why should you be? Yeah, amazing. I saw it and it was an amazing, you know, I saw it on your, it's great. It's great that you did that. So it sounds like, you know, your attitude, you really had to have a real positive get up and go attitude, even though there's been times that you've been really down. Yes. Um, and, you know, and I can understand why that depression would have kicked in, you know, those things, like you said, the traumas, you've had some major traumas in your life. Yeah. So, you know, getting past those traumas is challenging. Yes, you know? absolutely. Um, but you've turned around and had this attitude that I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make a difference. And, and you talked a little bit about um, your mission. Your mission in life is to pay it forward. Yes. <laughs> so paying it forward, I really am a big, big believer in what we, if we have something and we share that something with somebody or we do something uh, you know, a goodwill gesture, a kind gesture for somebody else, that ignites something in that person. And then they will then go on and do another act of kindness, another act of kindness. So any skills that we have, you know, it doesn't always, I think people sometimes get it confused that if we have to pay it forward, if we have to give something, it has to be monetary. It oh, yeah. doesn't have to be monetary, no. you know? It can be a kind word. It can be, you know, like on social media, it can be a, a share, a like, you know, just a discussion like we're having, like yeah. even this, what we're doing, we're empowering each other. We're igniting yeah. something in each other. And I think too often we see a lot of people like, oh, actually, if I do this, is it going to make that other person better than me? Or is it going to, you know, there's so much greed yes. and so much yeah you know sometimes what i what i've realized you know having been in in this business for three and a half years is that the people you thought that was going to help you are the ones that didn't and the people that you never thought would help you are the ones whose hands have come forward and helped you yep. and, and and it is amazing you know it opens you opens you but no no grudges for anybody but it just Absolutely. makes you look at life a little bit differently you know and i think you know, having these conversations like you're saying they're really important to have you know to be yep we need to have we so I, I said this before but we really do need to have more I mean people have commented about my daughter and me talking about her dating you yeah. know that's my daughter I don't care you know she's my I think you know I'd rather her be honest with me than lie to me and do things behind my back and you know a lot of the younger generation have come to me and said that's great that you're having you know you're being that role model with, yeah. you know, with your daughter but us but other, the, on my generation, the 50s, are a bit like, oh, my gosh, you're letting yeah. people know that your daughter's dated. Oh, yeah, guess what? She did it in front of me. I, I, I'm fine with it, you know? But, you know, these are, what I'm saying is the challenges are different kinds of challenges. 
absolutely and having these conversations which we need to more of not not just talk about all the good stuff but talk about like you said mental health i've suffered from depression in my life too mm. how did you, you know in that time i mean i know what i did i went through a very dark dark place in yes, your time yes. when you was going through that dark place what kept you going what was that one thing that kept you going oh my parents and my family 100 percent like my mum, like I'm sure Kimmy would say the same about you. Like, you know, sometimes when I hear you talk and speak to her, like it's so refreshing. Mm. Like, and I think I have had that. I've been so lucky to have that with my mum. Yeah. And I think if, yeah, if I didn't have that, yeah, definitely. Like she knew straight away, you know, something was up with me. She knew before I knew. <laughs> yes, yeah, mum. Mom. Yes. yeah. And so I think definitely that, that, positive figure that you have uh, you know bless my dad is amazing as well but you know the bond that you have with a mother yeah. is is just yeah. of a different kind you know yeah. um so i think i've been very very fortunate so um definitely my my mum and my family like i said even my extended family there's like 40 of us and we are just so such a close-knit family of course we have our ups and downs but if anything happens i say we're all there yeah. like we don't, yeah. you know so I think I've just been so fortunate and that growing up as well you know like again I've never had any comments you know, even growing up as kids you know sometimes we pick on things that we but never had anybody ever mentioned or said anything negative about my skin condition mm. and I think that really gave me power like actually and I also discovered Nevis Outreach who um they're a charity that deal with my skin condition so yeah. up until my 30s i'd never ever met anybody with the same condition as me oh wow and yeah and then i discovered this group i went to a conference in um chicago yeah. and it was all of a sudden there was more people like me and that gave me a lot of power and a lot of power yeah empowered yeah. you absolutely so you know um, you must I'm, have had a real deep connection when you met those oh, people. oh my god it's it, i have another family you know, I have another family and even there, now when I go there, I volunteer there and, you know, we had a family that came from Gujarat and yeah. their girl had a, a similar condition um, and I was interpreting, doing stuff there. So it, again, it's that paying it forward. God has given me so much and mm. I'm so grateful for it. So it's just right that I try and do my bit. And I think more of us need to go out there and just whatever we have, whether it's a skill, whether, you know, it's some some stuff that we don't need at home whether yeah. it could be anything, anything but let's be kind to each other that's that's obviously that's the key you know um you, you know you're talking and I'm, I'm listening to you and i'm thinking you know the the resilience you have is is just amazing you know to get up and really really go for it because you've just gone for it you know last <laughs> Is you've just gone for it the right I'm just gonna do this and I'm gonna go and I've seen the pictures in your in your in your website which is called is it called two rays hope or is it is it ash to two ray so um, my um, charity NGO work is ash to ray okay. and the work that I do in terms of body positivity is on my Instagram page which is ash to ray blog so it's two but they're kind of merging into one if that makes sense at the moment yeah. but two rays hope is is the website yeah, I mean, I've seen some of the pictures of the children you work with and, you know, I mean, they seem like they absolutely adore you and love you, those kids. All those big hugs I see, you know, they're really oh, amazing. Yeah. It's, it's unconditional love that I, I never thought I would feel, but yeah. it's just so amazing. They're such amazing children that are so talented and so full of love. They give to me before I give to them. So, yeah. you know, they, they say to me, oh, Didi, you know, you come to India, we're so lucky. And I'm like, no, I'm so lucky. Like, I yeah. feel like I'm the lucky one because, yeah. you know, not, not everybody gets that opportunity to reach out and, you know, fulfill their dreams. Because this is my dream, you know, yeah. to be able to help others. And with that, I feel that because I'm on such a positive journey and you know i believe in the universe i believe in god and you know yeah. my faith is the universe that is my faith um what would you say to people what would you say sorry i'm cutting you short because we're going to run out of time and i want to make sorry. sure we get through the questions in. what would you say to somebody who's listening right now and has been listening to you what would you say to them because you know there is i mean mental health is huge at the moment it's massive yes. and the anxiety 
um, we're having at the moment in lockdown and you know people are going to be losing their jobs or have lost their jobs you know yeah. and you know this is why you know my lovely friend Guinea came on because we wanted to inspire people that you know everyone's like with you you discovered that you had a gift you had a gift to empower other people um, and you know people are listening now they're, they're things they probably thought they you know wanted to do when they were younger never got around to doing it what would you say to people, you know, at this time, if they have a thought about doing something in their life, yep. never really got around, doing, around to doing it, what would you say to people? One, it is never too late. And again, it's, again, I feel that this question that you're asking me is so relatable to me right now. Because okay. some of the things that I'm doing at the moment, one of the things is I did a cosmetic campaign with Nindicore Cosmetics. Oh, in wow. Monday. She's amazing again you know and again that opportunity and yeah. that was one of my fears me in front of a camera so a girl that's had a skin condition being told you know she's ugly she's bullied for her looks yeah I was then in front of the camera and without even knowing it she'd asked me to step out of my comfort zone and for me that's like you know a godsend that was an angel yeah. for me to step out and that was you know that's in my 30s so again wow. that's something I've never thought I'd do um you know there's this there's, there's things happening now in my life that I thought I would never do you know watch your space I can't give too much away but no, again no, no, you know no, fine. but you know just get people you, so you're saying to people just get up and just do what you got to do right just do it and believe it it's so important to believe in yourself and believe that actually, you know what? Yeah, there's nothing that you can't do. And again, I do believe that I'm blessed with so many amazing people around me. Like, like I just mentioned, you know, Lindy Core, Manj Music, they're, they're big time celebrities and yeah. they believe in my cause and my mission. And that just, that's just so humbling. Yeah. You know, my family, my friends will support me. But when it comes to, you know, um, external people, yeah. um, you know, people that know people, want a lady that I met through a friend of mine donated like 500 pounds. Wow. And for me, that's just like, uh, I, I actually cried when that happened because yeah. that belief and that faith, if you are doing something with a true clean heart, things yeah. will just happen. And like I said, I'm so grateful to, you know, the people around me that have supported me. And again, right now, you know, with the, the um, people, like you said, that people that you thought, mm, maybe, maybe not, mm -hmm. the people that you thought were going to support you more are not. And then you've got these external people coming in and just sweeping you away with their love, their kindness, and just making you step out of your comfort zone. Yeah. So how was that? How was that photo shoot you did with Nindy Cole? How was it for you? It was really difficult, emotional, yeah. and yeah. so much fun at the same yeah. time. Because again, my biggest like camera and me now, like, but you know, it was amazing. It was so humbling to have like such big celebrities mm. actually believe in me. You know, like little old me kind of thing. So yeah. I was very humbled and I'm very, very lucky to have, you know, um, people around me that believe in the cause and the mission and just are so supportive. Yeah, wow, amazing. Amazing. So people listening now, they can hear. I mean, you've been through adversity. You really have, you know, <laughs> I, I can hear it. I mean, we, we're only hearing a snippet of what you've been through, you know, because at the moment we're doing like, we're doing having a conversation, it's chit chat, but... You know, we're just hearing a small smidge of what you must have been through. <laughs> Out of all of that, you know, what you've done. I mean, like I said, the list goes on, you know, motivational speaker and helping, and you know, child exploitation. The, you think the things, you, the stories you told me, the, the way you're working with the girls, um, yeah. that, the pet whose mothers are sex workers, the work, you know, you're educating those girls, you know, and and you saying that they're, they're they're amazing girls, lovely, uh, beautiful human beings, yeah. regardless of whatever situation they've come from. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, just the things you're doing, it's like, you know, wow, I'm just, I'm just so, I don't, I haven't got words to actually <laughs> tell you how I think, you know, wow, you know, it's, it's about being, you know, and you also put in somewhere that you do, it's also about being a Sikh woman. Of course, yes. And, yes. and you know, and uh, uh, putting in there that you do seva, which is what we call charitable work and voluntary work. 
it's a big part of you you've been brought up with that haven't you yes most definitely you know we've uh, always been to the gurdwara we do langars and that's the first thing that i can remember about my religion that the biggest thing that we can do for somebody else is to give them food or water and that has stuck with me throughout my life so yeah. you know wherever i can or if i see somebody that is in need of food water whatever it might be in my way i have to give back because again that's a part of who i am and that's what our sikhi tells us that yeah. to 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 give is you know the biggest thing you can do for somebody and those little things food and water like we can all do that mm -hmm. i mean and what's your what's your um, golden nuggets for people's takeaway after this conversation today my golden nugget would definitely without a doubt is believe in yourself and change your language a lot of the times we say i can't i can't i can't but just try changing that to i can and honestly it can really change the way you are and you know that connection between your mind body and soul is so important and once you get that connect yeah. honestly it's like a drug for me like my work is my drug yeah. I, I i just can't get enough of it and i will there's always something i have to do it you know there's that's no a love passion that's a lot of passion. definitely have a lot of love there for for what you're doing Yes, yeah. one hundred. I mean, you've, talk, you've talked about self belief. You know, I could talk to you. I could carry on talking to you. But you talked about <laughs> self belief. There must have been times when you didn't believe. What did you do? Oh, in those of course. Times? Of course. Don't get me wrong. I still have my bad days. You know, sometimes people say, "Oh my God, your life is so perfect." That, but they don't know the story. They don't know the background. Now people are kind of hearing my story. They're like, "Oh my God, I did not know that about you." Um, so yes, of course I have my down days, but then when I have those down days, again, it's about self-reflection, um, breathing is a big one for me to bring myself back into my space and where I am. You did the four, the four, the four pillars of breathing, right? Yeah, square breathing. Yeah. It's something that I was taught, so I really do believe in that, to compose and bring myself back. And again, the only moment that we live is this one. And by the time I finish this one, that's become yeah, history yeah. as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, definitely self belief and change your language, and I think yeah. that can really make a big difference in one's life. Definitely. Yeah, and recognize opportunities. Hundred percent. Yeah, my twenty twenty goal was I'm not saying to no opportunities that come my way and so far i've done that and it's just oh wow crazy. really wow, absolutely in terms of like you know i know covid has come but then out of this covid time mm -hmm. i've done three to four live instas yeah. i've done a live with yourself now yeah. there's um a video coming out tomorrow watch this space oh, wow. um which again is another project you know um it, it's just little little things that are happening by chance and i believe that if this time wasn't here maybe that that wouldn't happen because we get yeah. so bogged yeah. down with everyday life that sometimes we don't have time and i think it's been a real time of reflection oh yeah 100 percent. silver lining in everything isn't there Ash? that's, that's yeah. how i see life as well always look for the silver lining yes um, you know yes. um so gold London, what i'm taking away from you is that you know um it's humbling speaking to people like yourself ash you know that have been through it, all that and and come out of it and found a purpose it sounds like you've really found a purpose and that's motivated you and even though you have bad days you know you still get up and brush yourself off and continue and you know the fact that you're being so open about your mental health you know the depression you've gone through it's really it's really good and i think we need to speak more about it but you know what i'm really taking away is the fact that you have this amazing aura about you of just i don't know i mean i think i think the name really says it you know to to raise hope it really says it because you have you want a ray of light you know because you really like people's lives aren't you i mean what i like you said when they go when you go to india you feel honored that they're you're there and they feel honored that you're you're there you know so both ways you're giving you're shining a light um in other people's lives which is amazing and you know please please do share in the future all the other things that you're doing because yeah, um, i'd be i'd be really interested to know about everything else you're doing all these lovely ventures that you're gonna go into 
And um, lastly, you know, if somebody wanted to help in your charity, how could they find you again? Just, just tell me again. Um, yeah, of course. Donate or have a look, you know, because the work you do, and I've had a look at it myself. I'm, I haven't actually, to be honest, I haven't donated. Will do. But, you know, how could people donate to yourself? Yep, definitely. So you can go to www.toraisehope.org. And from there, we've got PayPal links and we've got an active um, Just Giving page as well. Um, but the PayPal is most relevant because what I do is over time, whatever is kind of collected that goes in um, when I go over to India and then I spit it between the charities that I work with. Or yeah. if we get a child in need, um, be it, you know, they're, they're suffering, um, you know, with a happy feet home, if they've got an illness or they're struggling with something and medical care is needed, then we can filter that um, uh, uh, donation into there. I've got like monthly donors as well um, who donate. So if you're interested in that, please just contact me. Um, we'll put my details maybe um, in the, the caption so people can get in contact and just get in contact you know let's yeah. talk because you know I know all the time people can't afford um, a monetary do donation and that's fine a share a like you yeah. know spreading the word that is a donation to you know us talking and you giving me the space to ask for donations that's a donation to you know so yeah. just spreading the word and please just do whatever you can in yourself um, to help and support um, people that need it. Yeah. Last, I've got to ask you one more question. Where do you see yourself in five years time? In five years time, what's, hopefully. What's the, what's the, what's the hope? The hope is to raise hope growing. Um, I want to be a registered charity, but there are some difficulties with that at the moment because I collect funds here and I want to take them to India. So there's a little bit of logistics there. So if anybody is a, an accountant, a solicitor and wants to donate some of their time to help yeah. me to do that, um, bring it on. I'd love that. Okay. Um, so yeah, to be a registered charity and doing this full time, that's where I would like myself to be in terms of body positivity, um, you know, face equality and doing my work in India and bringing it all together because India needs it a lot more as well. So being able to take everything I can to India to empower as many people as I can. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for being who you are. You are an amazing human being and I feel honoured to be able to interview you and I can't wait to see what you've got coming soon. I'm excited for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. A small snippet tomorrow, Manj yeah. Music is releasing uh, Social Distancing. So take a look at the video guys, it's on his YouTube channel and you might see a little surprise in there. Oh. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much, Ash. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.